presentation. So um, I wanted to introduce um, Jack, Dr. Jack here today. So Jack is going to be joining us at Life in Lemons as the new general medicine um, support specializing in um, hormonal health. So helping all people, men and women, um, navigate through homo hormonal um, challenges and hormonal fluctuations and just better understanding um, their bodies as well um, through diagnostics and through treatment. Um, and what we'll be specifically honing in on today is um, PMS and PMDD. So for those of you that if you've joined the call, then you're probably already very acutely aware of what PMDD is. Um, and what, so what I really want to do is better kind of demystify um, the difference between PMS and PMDD and these luteal phase um, hormonal discrepancies or imbalances that um, so many women are plagued with um, and how we can seek help, what treatment really looks like and how we can um, look at diagnosing something like that as well. Um, so what I want to do is um, pass this all over to Jack, um, just because I know that he's gonna have all the answers to everything that we're speaking about today. So I'm Jack, um, I'm a doctor in the UK, I'm, I'm a qualified GP, uh, so I've just finished my training as a general practitioner and I'm entering rehabilitation and sports medicine as of next week at Derby Hospital. Um, I've been involved sort of with the hormone management side of things long before I was a doctor. Um, I was involved sort of in my undergraduate through sports science and sports and exercise medicine uh, from sort of bodybuilding world and involved in sort of more the male hormone side of things. What I didn't want to be was one of those GPs or doctors that was useless with women's health. So I um, really sort of immersed myself uh, in learning all of the main things about sort of women's health, hormonal management, uh, PMS, and a particular interest in PMDD, which I've built up over the last couple of years. In my GP practice, I've probably initiated two or 300 women over the last couple of years on HRT and sort of taken them through that journey and that cycle. So I'm fairly experienced in knowing sort of how to initiate and manage sort of the, the pathway that would be indicated for the use of things like HRT and CRCP. So combined oral contraceptives or hormonal replacement therapy. Um, so I'm certified by the British Menopause Society in Menopause Management. So I'm certified to their specialist level so I can sort of prescribe testosterone therapy if needed alongside uh, HRT. Um, and like I said, I've had a big interest in hormones long before I was ever a medical doctor. Um, so I tend to take a holistic approach. I'm not a big fan of just prescribing medicines from the off. Um, I like to really look at the overall picture uh, and the beauty of private medicine over NHS is that I can spend time with you. Uh, I'm aware of the limitations that we have in the NHS as a doctor and as a patient, uh, being on both sides of things, obviously having 10 minutes to really delve into something just isn't suitable at all. So in the private world, I can give you that time and energy to go through the absolute bare basics of things like your lifestyle, nutrition, sleep patterns, sort of stress levels, what your day-to-day -day life is like. And then we can start looking at the more sort of medical approach to things before uh, we look at anything else. Um, so in terms of hormones, I mean, my focus is primarily on sex hormones. I am experienced in dealing with sort of other hormonal pathologies, but we are terrible in the UK at uh, dealing with hormonal pathology in terms of sex hormones. So, yeah, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. Uh, we are not very good at managing these side of things. Uh, America is significantly further ahead of us in that regard. Uh, so things like andropause is a big statement that we use in America for TRT, so testosterone replacement therapy in men. Uh, we're just very, very poor in the UK. And that falls down to two things, really. We are not very experienced in managing sort of the hormonal side of things from sex hormone uh, characteristics. And we are 
just don't have that specialist input within general practice. So for instance, if I wanted to initiate testosterone replacement therapy as an NHS GP, I would have to speak to a specialist first. So I need to go through endocrinology that may take many months uh, and the patient may be left sort of hypogonadal for many months before they had any input. Um, and even then, they're very, very disinclined to be prescribing TRT unless your sort of male hormone levels or your testosterone levels below eight nanomol. Uh, and with women, again, unless there's a specialist uh, within the practice, somebody who's experiencing HRT, women might find it very, very difficult to access sort of hormonal replacement therapy unless that, that specialist uh, training is there within general practice. We're very good at replacing other hormones. So when somebody has hypothyroid, we will chuck levothyroxine at them. If somebody's got Addison's, we'll chuck prednisolone or corticosteroids at them. If somebody's type 1 diabetic uh, and they've got a sort of deficiency of the pancreas, we'll chuck insulin. But the minute we are talking about sort of the sex hormone deficiencies, we're not very good at all with that. And that's what I'm hoping to sort of change, even if it's just on a small part uh, in private medicine. So in terms of PMS and PMDD, uh, so... Premenstrual disorders can be characterized through sort of many different symptoms that are sort of generic. They can come alongside many other medical conditions. But when we're talking about the difference between PMS and PMDD, the main difference is the impact that it has on that individual's life. So when we're looking at the DSM-5 criteria, which is basically our psychiatric manual of diagnosing these conditions, we need to have one of those top core symptoms. And then generally another five of the other following symptoms. And these should be present usually one week prior to day one of a female cycle. And they should get significantly better after they start their cycle. So what tends to happen with a PMDD pattern is that one to two weeks prior to day one of their cycle, they have an absolutely overwhelming symptoms and negative effects on their life. And that's the big difference between PMS and PMDD. Most people with PMS may have one, two, three of these symptoms, but they can get on with their day-to-day -day life generally. doesn't severely impact or disrupt their life. Women with PMDD tends to make their life absolute hell. Uh, and when I've spoken to some women diagnosed with PMDD, it's gone to the point where some of them have lost their jobs, uh, lost relationships, not being able to get through their day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. And some of them, fortunately, even attempted suicide. Uh, and there is significant mounting evidence that those with PMDD have a significantly higher suicide rate. One study in America showed a 34% uh, suicide attempt amongst women, uh, amongst one study that they did in 2022. Generally, we confirm it with a diarrhea symptom. So we would look at the symptoms sort of over a pattern of two consecutive cycles. We'd write down sort of the symptoms and correlate them to the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria. And like I said, they should be present really in that week prior to your cycle and get significantly better with that week uh, the day after your first uh, cycle. Uh, so day one, day two, they should start to significantly improve. So what cause is it? We don't exactly know. Uh, the evidence is that it's a hormone sensitivity disorder. So we feel from evidence base that we have uh, that it is down to progesterone and it's metabolite allopregnanolone. So it's not particularly how much of it is there, but the way it impacts certain receptors within the brain. Uh, normally, allopregnanolone and progesterone um, tends to have a calming effect on women, but in those with PMDD, it tends to have an opposite effect. So it's, it interacts with serotonin receptors, GABA receptors, uh, glutamate, and it affects sort of them feel good endorphins within the body. And for some reason, it just impacts people significantly different uh, with PMDD. And they have an atypical response. There's a genetic component that we found in some twin studies. So we found that some inherited factors are found. It's found between twins. Uh, and we think now that there's a genetic cause behind it. In terms of risk factors, we know that previous trauma, uh, sort of severe depression, anxiety, previous post-traumatic stress, uh, smokers, obesity and low parity. So people who have had uh, not been pregnant or have not given birth tend to have more severe PMDD. Uh, and that is simply, they believe, down to exposure to more menstrual cycles and more exposure to progesterone as metabolites. There's a fantastic source of information in the UK, uh, which is impmd.org and MIND. And that contains a lot of information in terms of sort of diagnostic criteria. Uh, things that we can try both from patients and clinicians' point of view. So like I said, in terms of diagnosis, keep a symptom diary. So we tend to say two consecutive cycles present at least a week before and a significant improvement past day one of the cycle. 
Uh, and it is a diagnosis of exclusion. So there's no blood tests uh, in particular for PMDD. It's not a diagnostic criteria to have bloods. However, if we're thinking about ruling out other conditions, so if you're thinking about things uh, like thyroid issues, low vitamin D, uh, there's some associations with vitamin D and low mood, then it might be worth I'll just getting a basic full blood count, uh, urine electrolytes and thyroid function tests alongside things like hematinic, so B12, folate, ferritin, and a vitamin D just to assess that there's no obvious reversible cause of symptoms. Uh, like I said, there can be some overlap. So you can find that things like depression, anxiety, uh, the chronic fatigue syndrome, thyroid issues, and psychiatric disorders can all overlap in symptoms that could present quite similar to PMDD. So it's more a diagnosis of exclusion and just sort of ruling out that there's nothing else that's obviously jumping out that could be causing the symptoms. In terms of red flags, so things to really look out for, like I said, there was one study that showed that in America, there was a 34% increase uh, of attempted suicide in PMDD sufferers. So it's really about ruling out that there, there's no suicidal tendencies within patients. Um, it can exacerbate other issues, particularly things like depression and OCD. Uh, and if there's any severe psychiatric issues in the background, if it's accompanied symptoms that are getting similar to PMDD, but there's also PV bleeding outside of your cycle. So if there's any abnormal bleeding outside of your normal cycle, that's something that definitely needs to be investigated. Uh, and if you are getting things like severe abdominal pain with bowel symptoms, so any blood in your stool, changing bowel habits, looser stools, more constipated, then we need to obviously be ruling out that this isn't something like an IBD, so an inflammatory bowel disease or a bowel cancer and things like fit testing, so to check for microscopic blood within the poo might be necessary. And then if there's any accompanying severe joint pains, we need to be also ruling out things like an arthropathy, inflammatory arthropathies or things like fibromyalgia. So how do we treat it? It's very, very difficult from my experience. It's not something that just tends to respond to the first thing you try. Uh, people tend to get along better with one thing over another compared to somebody else. So I've tried an SSRI, so something like um, sertraline or citalopram in a patient and their symptoms have gone completely. And in others, it's made them very uh, much worse in terms of how severe those symptoms were. We need to take into account the history of the patient, especially if they've got any associated mental health history. And I tend to start with the very basics and sort of add things on. So I'll go through sort of the very basics that we might try with somebody. There's very little evidence for the basics, but anecdotally, I tend to see a good response for trying the basics before we start adding in sort of medications. So treatment wise, lifestyle changes, just sort of generic for everyone. The usual weight loss, exercise, uh, diet, looking at the nutrition, sleep side of things, stress. What can we do to change their life for the better that might have a secondary effect and knock on to sort of their PMDD symptoms? There's no evidence specifically in PMDD, but we know just from a general lifestyle improvement side of things, there's significant evidence to improve that side of things. Um, I recommend that all patients take vitamin D, B6, B12 and calcium. Again, there's no real robust evidence uh, studies to this, but we know anecdotally that symptoms have improved significantly, particularly with the increase of calcium. So cognitive behavioral therapy, so talking out symptoms, talking through and trying to sort of unlock where those symptoms are coming from, particularly if there's a psychiatric history within the patient. When I'm thinking about medications, I tend to start something like an SSRI first. So I'll go for something like sertraline, citalopram, citalopram. There's no real one better than the other. The way we think it works is it affects sort of the metabolism, allopregnetolone and the way that it affects the serotonin receptor within the brain. So we think it sort of changes that and, and modulates its effects. Uh, we can try a combined oral contraceptive pill. Um, so things like Yaz, uh, particularly ones that are sort of less anti-androgen uh, in terms of their effect, tends to have a better outcome. Uh, and again, that's just controlling the hormonal flux. So we're trying to keep that progesterone and estrogen level stable rather than the fluctuations. Uh, alongside the more serious things is GNRH analogs. So these are things like Zolodex and Prostep. You might have heard of them being used uh, in things like prostate uh, cancers. So they're androgen sensitive cancers. And what these effectively do is just suppress that pituitary secreting luteinizing hormone and follicular stimulating hormone, which drops those hormone levels down. Uh, something I wouldn't really try in, in sort of patients, but it has been documented you can try things like, so they're called 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. So you might have seen these used in things like uh, increasing the size of prostate, so benign prostatic hypertrophy or sort of hair loss on the private market. 
and in women we tend to try to test the ride over finasteride and then from the more severe side of things we try things like antipsychotics like quetiapine again it's not something that i would really prescribe in private medicine because it needs monitoring uh, it needs initiating things like an ecg uh, regular blood testing for things like prolactin so it's not an ideal medication to be starting in the private world uh, and then at the extreme side of things, we can try things like hormone replacement therapy. And I say the extreme side of things, and that's simply because there's not a great deal of evidence for using HRT in women under the age of 40. Uh, and when we are sort of talking about women who are going through cycles, generally we're talking in the vast majority of cases that women are under the age of 40. So it wouldn't really be used as often. And then in the most extreme cases, a hysterectomy uh, and bilateral oophorectomy, so removing the ovaries, and the uterus itself just to prevent any sort of uh, ovulation and hormonal effects but again you're talking about the extreme on that side of things and i've never actually seen it done in practice so minimal evidence uh, there has been studies done for using progesterone only um so what this is trying to do is stabilize at a progesterone level but as i said before uh, this is not necessarily the level of progesterone but the response in the brain to it so if we chuck something like a micronized progesterone at somebody, there's a good chance the symptoms might get significantly worse. Things like saffron, uh, which is crocus sativus, it's uh, just a herbal supplement. Again, there's one or two studies for the use of saffron, but a very, very poor evidence base. Benzodiazepines, so um, things like diazepam, uh, we just generally don't use full stop just because of their addictive nature. And then the IUD, so the intrauterine device, which is just progesterone only like a marina coil. Great contraceptive, it's just that there's no real efficacy in terms of sort of PMDD because it acts locally and we don't think it has much of an impact on those overall hormonal levels. So in terms of contraindications, when I'm talking about sort of initiating these medications um, for CSCP, so your combined oral contraceptive pill, we'd use the UK MET criteria. So we're looking at things like previous uh, clots, breast cancer, migraine with aura. So if you get any flashing lights or strange symptoms prior to the migraine coming on, uh, smoking status, if you're overweight, etc. We're looking for a UK MET category two or below. Anything above this, the risk is uh, outweighs the benefit of using this. With HRT, things like previous or current breast cancer, estrogen dependent cancers, uh, undiagnosed PV bleeding, or significant liver problems with raised LFTs, we wouldn't really use HRT. Um, SSRIs, if somebody has poorly controlled epilepsy, so if the seizures aren't very well controlled or other medications that prolong part of when we're looking at an ECG, if we're looking at the QT, uh, it's the interval of how long that is taken. If it's prolonged, we wouldn't want to give a medication that would prolong that for even longer. Ultimately, though, it's a discussion with the patient. So it's weighing up the risk and benefit and seeing whether they are happy to start using these things. So long as they're counseled well and everything's discussed in general, risks, benefits, how long we might try it for. Uh, in terms of HRT, we tend to say, if we're not getting benefit after six months, it's probably not worthwhile carrying it on. Same with COCP, we need to give it that time. But if we're not getting that benefit, then it's probably best to take people off because we're talking about a risk benefit ratio that's probably not beneficial anymore. Uh, and then we're looking at sort of how we would give the medication itself. So with HRT, I always tend to use topical just because the uh, risk of a clot is significantly lower when we're giving it topical versus oral. Um, side effects, just the usual things that will come along with hormones. So things like bloating, headaches, uh, breast tenderness. I always tell women to apply the patch below the waist. Uh, and there is some evidence that it does uh, can increase sort of the risk of breast cancer if that is applied nearer the breast because it can change some of the tissue within the breast. Mood changes are simply because of the way that the hormones work. Uh, and there's no strong evidence. I see a lot of women saying that they've gained weight off the back end of HRT, but there isn't any strong evidence. Uh, for this but anecdotally I do see quite a lot of women come in with these symptoms and also present with sort of a lower sex drive uh, and again anecdotally this is probably just because it's increasing your sex hormone binding globulin and creating less free testosterone and this is why we might consider prescribing testosterone alongside uh, the HRT but again that's off license and there's no licensed testosterone for women in the UK at the minute. So in terms of myself, what I can do differently, um, so I can give you the time, the energy. Um, like I said, 10 minutes is just not sufficient. Often in general practice, somebody won't just be coming to see me about PMDD. Uh, they'll be seeing me about three other issues. So that's 10 minutes to deal with potentially three significant, very, very different problems. The PMDD might be the very last thing that I get to spend one minute with them. Um, and I wouldn't get that time and energy. In private medicine, we have 45 minutes. 
we can really delve into symptoms when they started, what might be affecting it, what I can change in your life day to day, uh, blood tests that might be beneficial. Um, and on site, we have other practitioners. So there's a very strong evidence base for things like acupuncture and alternative medicine for improving the secondary symptoms. So not PMDD directly, but things like improving mood, serotonin, all those type of things that might improve the symptoms. Uh, there's a lot of evidence for things like acupuncture. So it's great that I have access to sort of other practitioners on site. Blood tests, like I said, I can check for other things. So thyroid levels, low hormone levels, looking at stress hormones like cortisol, DHEA levels to make sure that this isn't something else going on in the background. Um, and like I said, I've got significant experiences. Not many practitioners in the UK that have much experience with PMDD. And if you mention the name to a lot of the doctors, they probably wouldn't have heard of it before. Uh, so it's something that you need to have quite significant experience in managing to have sort of success and improving symptoms with people. So in terms of how you book in with myself, um, via Life and Lemons Clinic. So I'm doing approximately two clinics a month at the minute due to my CQC exemption status uh, th that has been agreed with the CQC. I can't see people other than face to face. It has to be face to face at the minute. I am putting all of the sort of necessary registration in over the next year to be able to do remote. But at the minute, as it stands, I can only see people face to face. And that is better for people, particularly with symptoms like this. I need to meet you and see you face to face to really get that input uh, and get that expertise there rather than dealing with you over the phone and not meeting you. Uh, that's my website there. And that is the Life and Lemons link. If anyone wants to have a look sort of availability when I'm there over the next sort of couple of months just to see about getting booked in. Um, I do like to see people for 45 minutes initially just so we can really delve into everything and then subsequent follow-ups can be sort of 30 minutes. Um, I wouldn't book a blood test without speaking to you first and seeing you initially just simply and solely because I like to tailor blood tests to individuals and not just take a scattergun approach. What that tends to lead to is distress and anxiety when you get these abnormal markers that are probably not indicative of anything that's actually going on. So I like to really sort of maximise uh, or minimise in some instances what blood tests we might actually do. So that's about it for everything that I would offer in clinic, uh, sort of a brief overview of PMDD. I know it's quite a lot, uh, but if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. I'll do my best to answer them. Um, it's, again, something that's emerging in the UK uh, only over the last couple of years. So evidence base is building, um, but I, I feel like I know quite a significant amount in terms of what we know already. Uh, and I am contributing to sort of the IMPMD uh, database in terms of evidence collection. So if anyone has any specific questions or anything they want to ask, then feel free. Lovely. Um, feel free to unmute yourself um, or just drop a message in the chat. Um, but whilst we kind of wait for anyone's questions, if they come in, um, we did have a couple of questions prior to this um, talk, <clears throat> um, which were, I did write them down and now I've lost them just now. <laughs> Okay, so um, you mentioned obviously hormone, uh, different hormones, including the contraceptive pill. Um, uh, one patient asked how hormonal IUD plays a part in this and if that could also have any impact or any relevance for treatment and support. In terms of the marina coil, so the intrauterine device, is that what we're talking about? Yeah. Yes. So evidence based for improving symptoms is minimal. It doesn't really do anything from the evidence that we have simply because the progesterone tends to act locally. So it gives that endometrial protection. Uh, it's licensed for longer now in terms of that endometrial protection. Now. But in terms of offering systemic effects, improving sort of PMDD, there's very little evidence. Anecdotally, I know women that have used marina coils and the symptoms have gotten significantly worse, but the evidence base just isn't there as to why that happens. Uh, and the evidence that we have is when we remove the coil, symptoms go away. But again, that's anecdotally, I'm seeing patients that will present a year after having the coil and still not feel right. Um, so that's something that's obviously a, a concern in terms of the evidence base that we do have. Uh, and it's when I might start delving deeper into things in general, in terms of if there's anything necessary testing wise, blood testing wise, just to see what people's hormone levels are like. Because I have found anecdotally after using sort of the marina coil, that people have had some suppression in terms of the uh, estrogen and progesterone levels prior uh, and compared to what they were when they had blood done maybe a couple of years prior to the coil. And there was no other real differentiating factors as to why that might be. But the, like I said, the evidence isn't very good in terms of why that's happening. But there's certainly some anecdotal link there. But in terms of improving symptoms, I don't think it really does anything at all. And in fact, it might make things actually worse.
Lovely. Okay. That's really interesting. Um, you say that because I was going to ask you about um, comorbidities and if there were any, <clears throat> any patterns of disease or um, issues going on that you often see in combination with PMDD that women can start to perhaps piece together these um these things for themselves um things like endometriosis or PCOS for example um because I often again see many of my patients come in um with these types of PMDD PMDD symptoms that have also been kind of undiagnosed but tick all the boxes for endometriosis and then have the coil and it's absolutely diabolical catastrophic nightmare for them um and so yeah it's interesting uh that you said that in that respect um but it would be good to know what your thoughts were in, in regards to those patterns of diseases that kind of come in combination with each other yeah there's definitely a link i think particularly between i see patients presenting with pmdd that might have had either a query diagnosis of things like PCOS in the past. Um, and that's simply, I think, just off the back end of those increased androgen levels. A lot of the times people uh, with PCOS might be overweight, so there might be that sort of secondary effect in terms of increasing estrogen levels in the background. They know there's some evidence for sort of increasing estrogen and overall estrogen levels that might impact sort of PMDD symptoms. Uh, and again, just a general lifestyle side of things. In terms of things like endometriosis, not something I've seen very often with PMDD, but uh, particularly previous psychiatric issues, um, a lot of women that I've seen with PMDD might have had sort of a very distant previous psychiatric past or gone through a very traumatic event at some point in their life, usually when they were a child. Uh, and that tends to be something that really presents itself quite often when I delve deeper. And again, the benefit of private medicine is you can ask these questions and give people the time to really delve into these things because it's not very appropriate to be asking patients within three or four minutes of the last part of a consult in NHS land about sort of severe trauma and past psychiatric issues. Uh, so that's that's a good thing in terms of private medicine to really get to the bottom of these issues and see whether there's anything holistically we can support with as well. Mm -hmm. it's, it would make such a difference to so many women because as you mentioned, it's never just one thing um these types of conditions amongst many other women's health issues um they're multifactorial it's, it's, and you can't possibly spend as you said at four to eight minutes um dissecting all of that relevant information in the level of de depth and detail that women need to perhaps better understand exactly what's going on and also carve out a specific treatment. That's what we yeah. typically see. And as you mentioned um, before, um, this this particular type of condition often goes missed um, quite frequently. Um, and it's not something that is, is spoken about or heard of in some instances. Um, and I've known, again, a number of patients recite uh, a huge amount of information to their GP and say, you know, I fit this bill and like, yeah. oh, well. I've had patients really sure. I've uh, spoke to the doctor and they've, they've never heard of it. It's um, mm. it's quite worrying really, but I mean, PMDD has often been misdiagnosed as depression and anxiety and threat as such. Um, and once that happens and people are labelled with that, it then becomes a bit of a barrier for access to healthcare because doctors instantly will just think that this is another psychiatric problem that's coming up when actually it may be something very, very different uh, yeah. and often leads to sort of poor outcomes in healthcare and sort of the treatment patterns that exist. Mm -hmm. Most will get chucked on an SSRI. Um, I don't know if I mentioned it, but with SSRIs, what we tend to see is in patients with depression, we might see four to six weeks before any improvement of symptoms, whereas with PMDD, what we tend to find is during that luteal phase, we might just prescribe it for two weeks off license because the response to an SSRI is usually rapid within a day or two that people's uh, sort of brain function changes significantly to the point where they have a significant improvement in symptoms. So that's sort of a, a way I sometimes diagnose PMDD sort of off record that if they have a rapid response to an SSRI rather than a month or two, that can be an indicator that this is more of a PMDD rather than depression, anxiety side of things. So, but again, doctors may follow up four or five weeks later with a patient in general practice rather than after a few days and we might be able to follow up in private practice and really find out if they've had an impact in quite a quick amount of time.
Yeah. Um, so valuable to be able to do that. Um, I think uh, one of the other questions, which, um, because it's great to know how, uh, from a hormone perspective um, and from a hormonal treatment perspective and an SRI, SSRI perspective, um, things can be managed. Uh, one of the other questions from one of our practitioners, uh, from one of our patients was, um, what kind of, um, foods and vitamins would be beneficial in this instance? Now I would ordinarily refer back to our, um, our nutritional therapist, Delaria on this one. And I'm sure this is something that she can expand on in great detail, but I'd love to know your thoughts, um, as we did get this question through. Yeah, I mean, again, just general lifestyle improvements. There's no significant evidence specifically for PMDD, but we know the impact that, you know, a, a diet that is uh, enriched with all the minerals, nutrients, macro, micronutrients that we need day to day is uh, has that significant benefit on overall health and well being. Uh, so I would suggest, you know, anecdotally that it has a significant impact on the symptoms of PMDD, particularly when we think about sort of the the gut brain response in terms of that hormonal axis that we're finding more about in terms of sort of the foods we eat have a significant impact on our brain function uh, and if we're talking about sort of serotonin gabinergic receptors uh, and the way that these work within the brain then obviously there's that direct link between the foods that we would eat and the sort of symptoms that we might experience with pmdd so yeah 100 percent there's there's going to be some degree of diet link what that link is is yet to be known but obviously eating right properly and the foods that you uh, you know you've got to enjoy your food you, uh, I see a lot of people who have very poor relationships with food particularly in the bodybuilding world uh, and they don't enjoy the day-to-day -day food so you have to have enjoyment there but at the same time that food has to be nutritious and beneficial for your day-to-day -day life um, on the side of vitamin side of things as I said, the main sort of vitamins that are evidence-based are things like B6 or P5P, if we're buying it in a supplement form, B12, calcium, uh, and sort of uh, vitamin D uh, supplements that are the most evidence-based, magnesium as well. Uh, and I recommend that everyone sort of has them in their day-to-day -day, uh, multivitamin or dietary supplement intake. Again, they're just supplements. They shouldn't be sort of making up the bulk of how you get your nutrition. They should just be an add-on uh, and a supplement rather than sort of trying to replace things that you're not getting in your day-to-day -day diet. Lovely. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Um, because I think often it's the case that people will come in and say, what supplements will I should I be taking? And um, in fact, what they haven't done is looked at food first um, mm. and how what they're putting into their body is far more significant than um, the additional supplements that you can take. Nothing is ever going to replace the benefit that we'll get from food. Mm. Um, yeah. It's just a supplement. It's just something extra that we can be doing for ourselves and health. So food first and hydration second, supplements third perspective. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, just finally, because I know that I don't want to keep you for too long, um, but from my personal perspective, I'd love to know your thoughts in regards to this. And this is just something that's kind of occurred to me whilst you've been talking. Um, but given the um, kind of the pathophysiology of this, that you said there's kind of like this progesterone sensitivity in these in these women in a way, if I've understood correctly, um, the... Um, we see this a lot with women going through IVF as well, um, where, you know, they're, they're dosed on progesterone, um, in that second part of their cycle and, um, they, they often don't respond too well to it. They, they can become quite symptomatic. And again, they typically fit that, um, they typically have other things going on as well. Again, we, yeah. I, really see this with things like um endometriosis um and again someone that might fit the bill of pmdd for example um i'd love to know your thoughts and again and this is completely off the cuff and i know that fertility is not necessarily your area of um speciality but i'd love to know your thoughts on how um if or how we can navigate that from for women that have to take progesterone, for example, with fertility treatment, but that are progesterone sensitive. 
I suppose it's a individualized approach to that patient. Uh, I suppose if the patient is getting prescribed your usual sort of uh, IVF medications, things like HMG, so human menopausal gonadotrophins, clomiphene, the usual medications that you would be given, it's not particularly individualized. And a lot of women uh, only qualify for certain amount of cycles before they then have to go private or buy their own medications. So there might not be that input as to sort of an individualized approach. I suppose in this uh, question in terms of private medicine and to the, our clinic ourselves, I can look at what they are taking, what they're given from sort of an IVF approach and I can give some input. Now I'm not a specialist in that area, I don't claim to be. Uh, but I do have significant sort of uh, experience with the use of things like human menopausal gonadotrophins and clomiphene. And I would be able to sort of break down if there's any sort of big patterns with the things that they may or may not be taking that might be impacting things. But again, it's down to the individualized approach of the patient and what their priorities are. If their priorities are to get pregnant, unfortunately, sometimes uh, it's a case of that they may have to go through certain side effect profiles to sort of get there. Uh, and that is just medicine in general, particularly in the NHS, like I said, just because it's not very individualized. Um, but sort of working alongside myself, I can give my input to the level that I'm comfortable giving and to seeing if there's anything we can change from other aspects of their life. I would never dream of messing with medications sort of uh, prescribed by an obstetrician or gynecologist or a specialist fertility doctor, but uh, we can look at the other side of things and just see if there's anything that's impacting their life that we could uh, sort of change or add in uh, to maybe improve symptoms from that side of things. Lovely. That's uh, really helpful and useful to know because it's a, I think it's something that affects a lot of women. And when they've been through multiple rounds, they start to dread that particular period of um, their IVF process. Um, so just knowing that perhaps there's someone that they can speak to that could offer them some support prior um, or or help them navigate some answers um, would, yeah, it's just really handy, very useful. Yeah, yeah. Lovely. Um, well, uh, we don't have any other questions currently, but what I'm going to suggest doing is for those people that weren't able to join today, um, is to just drop us an email and we'll shoot them over to you, um, at some point. Yeah, no um, that's okay. Lovely. Um, unless there's anything else that you want to add well, it's just to add from the other side of things that it's not just women's health that I focus on, it's men's as well. I'm just covering sort of women's side of things. So if there is any men that uh, are particularly thinking about testosterone replacement therapy or whether they are symptomatic of sort of hypergonadism or low testosterone, then that's something that I can certainly help with as well as something that I have sufficient experience in. A little bit different to the women's management side of things, and it would involve uh, two separate blood tests, four weeks apart, uh, fasted and early morning, just to make sure that you fit into that sort of eight to 12 nanomoles or below eight nanomoles uh, and symptomatic and then we can consider prescribing things like testosterone replacement therapy in the, the forms of gels or injections if needed. Um, but again, uh, it's not something I'm particularly talking about today, but just to let people know that I also deal with men's health as well. Lovely. Thank you. On on that subject, and again, I know it's a huge subject, and I'd love to actually do another talk with you um, about this. Um, it's something that we see massively overlooked is, is men's health in when it comes to fertility. Um, and they're often given a sperm sample. And then if it's borderline okay, then it's fine. And uh, what's never done is any um, uh, any hormone tests, no, never any hormone profiles. And what they're never looking at as well is, is lifestyle. Um, so they're never even asked about that. They're never even looked at the, their BMI, for example, is never taken and yet women's is scrupulously, uh, dissected at every appointment. Um, in, and that's a reflection of their health, should we say. Yeah. And so it's great to know that this is an area that you're so open and willing to explore and, and something that you, you know, you specialize in. Um, or have a special interest in because um, we so actively push for adequate male diagnostics when it comes to um, fertility and preconception support. And just looking at something as simple as their hormone profile um, can be huge in regards to um, a reflection of overall general health and um, what potential treatments could be on offer for them from a hormone therapy perspective. Mm -hmm. 
potentially. Um, so as I said, I know it's a huge topic, but it's an area that we're really passionate about because it's so unspoken about and anything to stop women from being poked and prodded um, within an inch of their life um, is something that Absolutely. I'm... Absolutely. Yeah. A lot of the times, unfortunately, they focus more on the woman than the man. So the man will say, there's nothing wrong with me. It's not me. It's the other side of things. And women will get every test under the sun. Uh, and they'll end up getting things like anti-malarial hormone testing done and the man will maybe do a sperm sample at best uh, and that's whether or not they decide to get it done so it's uh, it's something that's not necessarily looked upon as as well as it should be done and as you say things like obesity there's a massive link between obesity high estrogen levels uh, and sort of the the hormonal profile of men and it's known in bssm guidelines the british society of sexual medicine and european society of sexual medicine that we sort of navigate that nutritional pathway first uh, before we start even thinking about prescribing testosterone i've seen men who are grossly obese uh, with significantly high progesterone prolactin levels estrogen levels very low testosterone levels the minute we drop that weight off their testosterone levels will come back into a completely normal normal state and they, they end up being fertile so there's a lot of things we can change prior to chucking medications at people a long time before we think about that but it's just not something that's really done in nhs uh, or public medicine it's something um, that should be, but equally, I respect why it isn't. Yeah, it's time, time and energy, <laughs> yeah. and uh, unfortunately, it's, it's the knowledge base that's there. Sometimes <laughs> it's just we can't expect general practitioners to have a knowledge of everything, hence why we have specialist interests, and hence why some of us might go into areas that, where we can class ourselves as specialists and, and give specialist input. There's a few doctors like myself, uh, there's an alleged clinic in Doncaster that focuses primarily on TRT, and that's been run by a GP who we, endocrinologists will go to for advice and guidance, uh, just simply because he knows so much more than he, they do about very specific areas. Wow, uh, so that's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's very good. There's a lot of GPs with highly specialist knowledge but again at the end of the day you're a generalist you're meant to know a little bit about everything rather than a lot about everything so sometimes that that knowledge base just is lacking there uh, but that's why people like me exist in sort of medicine and why we sort of take these special interests on lovely thank you so much for your time really appreciate it and it's been so no informative um i hope that um the more we spread this message the more women will feel like they can resonate with this, but also know that they aren't alone in this. There's something that they can actively do because it can be a really lonely and disheartening place to be when you're in the dark depths of that luteal phase and um, really struggling um, to even just get through the day. So um, it's great to know that there's there's someone that they can reach out to for support um, and that there are really tangible um, evidence-based answers as well um, to be able to support them in that way. Um, but yeah, so thank you. I really appreciate that, Jack. No problem at all. Yeah, if anyone has any other questions or anyone's not here, obviously just feel free to send an email off and I'm happy to answer whatever. I can't give individualized sort of medical advice, but I can answer sort of gener general, uh, general generic questions and sort of answers in that aspect. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining today. Thank you, um... everyone. Appreciate it. <laughs> okay, thanks, Jack. I'll speak to you soon. Speak to you soon. See you later. <laughs>